There are many experimental techniques that can be used to perform new materials research, including X-ray diffectometry, scanning probe microscopy, and magnetometry. Among the most accessible, yet still challenging, of these techniques is electrical transport measurement. Electrical resistance can reveal physical properties of materials that include the nature of its charged carriers, the scattering of these carriers and their interactions with the crystalline lattice, and other exotic behaviors that may arise, perhaps in the presence of a magnetic field. In this experimental methods overview, we will learn more about how to perform a transport measurement, specifically with the aid of the Qualm Design Electronic Transport Option, or ETO module, as part of the VersaLab. You may be familiar with the use of a handheld multimeter, which we typically use to measure resistance, current, or voltage. It's a great tool for spot checking problems around the lab or even in your home, but it's not necessarily the best instrument for characterizing materials. Allow me to demonstrate why. Here's a piece of copper wire that we have silver painted to the pads on the VersaLab measurement puck. The resistivity of copper is 1.68 times 10 to negative 8 ohm meter. Recall that a material's resistance is determined by its resistivity multiplied by the ratio of the length to the cross-sectional area of the material. Using this 4 centimeter length of copper, I expect the resistance to be around 0.6 milliohm. Let's plug this into the diagnostic puck box that comes with every QD instrument and find out. I will use the multimeter to read across the wire. Okay, let's see what we get. 0 0.2 ohm. That's quite a bit more than we would expect from such a small sample of copper. Why is this? Well, look at what's between the probes. It's not just copper wire. You have the wiring and also the silver contacts contributing to the measurement load. In other words, a two-wire measurement also picks up the contact resistance that's in series with the sample, so it's not a true characterization of the material. Contact resistances can vary for a number of reasons, so how do we get around this? Well, we could attach four contacts to this wire. There should be no surprise that we would perform what is called a four-wire measurement. The Qualm Design puck box is well labeled with the various channels and the measurement puck. I'll connect the sockets mark I to the output of a constant current source, and I'll connect the sockets mark V to the input of a multimeter. Let's see what we get. Between 1.2 and 1.3 milliohm. Much better. The measurement does not match up perfectly to theory, but I make no claim that this is a perfect measurement. We applied a known current to the material, and we isolated the voltage input contacts from the path of the current. There is certainly contact resistance at the voltage input, but that becomes part of the high impedance of the voltmeter anyway. As a result, the voltage drop that we measure is primarily restricted to the sample. Applying Ohm's law, V equals IR, allows us to determine the resistance. Naturally, one would measure the dimensions of the material between the voltage contacts in order to determine the material resistivity. It all sounds pretty straightforward, right? You can, of course, jump right into a transport measurement using any DC source and voltmeter, but life is not always so simple. For instance, did you notice some noise in our reading? Noise becomes alarming if you are trying to measure a small signal. One source of noise comes from thermoelectric EMFs, which are generally resolved in a DC measurement by taking the average of a forward and reverse current reading. An AC method called the lock-in technique can overcome such noise issues. The fundamental idea is quite elegant. Let's create a simple diagram of a single channel lock-in amplifier. We begin with some signal input that we want to measure, such as the voltage reading off a four-wire measurement. The signal goes into an amplifier where the signal is increased by some gain. Next, we need a sine wave generator or oscillator that generates a reference signal that we control. The amplified signal and the reference are then mixed meaning that they are multiplied with one another. This mixed signal then goes through a low-pass filter, and a final output signal is obtained. This output is a much better measurement than what we just performed, and I'll take some straightforward mathematics to explain why. We'll go back to see what the mixer does. It multiplies the signal with our reference. Since this is an AC technique, both the signal and reference are sine waves. G is the amplifier gain, omega is the angular frequency of the wave, and phi is the phase constant of the signal. By applying a trigonometric identity, the mixture output takes on a final form of one half the product of the wave amplitudes and two cosine terms. Let us take this mixture output and consider the case where the signal frequency matches the reference frequency. We can therefore just call omega sub s and omega sub r the same omega. The output now has two terms, but notice that the first cosine term yields a constant value and the second cosine term oscillates at two omega. 
Next, we apply the low-pass filter. The filter removes the time-varying signal, the second cosine term, and leaves only the first cosine term, which is a constant. The final output is therefore a constant value proportional to the product of the signal and reference amplitudes. In other words, the AC signal has been transformed into a constant DC output. This is why the technique is called locked-in amplification. The instrument is looking to lock in the signal input to the reference sine wave. The advantage of this technique is made clear when the signal frequency is not the same as the reference frequency. We take the mixer output as before, and now both cosine terms vary in time. The first term has a frequency corresponding to the difference in frequencies between the signal and the reference, and the second term has a frequency corresponding to the sum frequencies of the signal and the reference. By applying the low-pass filter, ideally, there is no output. We will soon demonstrate this using the Electronic Transport Option, or ETO, module of the VersaLab. Before we perform a measurement of the ETO, we should note that our previous discussion has been about the analog lock-in technique. The VersaLab ETO performs measurements using a digital lock-in technique controlled by the module's digital signal processor, or DSP. Instead of a mixer and a digital lock-in amplifier, the input signal is integrated with a digitally created reference sine wave over one cycle in order to obtain the lock-in result. This has the advantage of being so accurate as to not have the extra harmonics that can be present in an analog reference signal. This output is non-zero if the signal possesses the same frequency as the digital reference. The ETO filters noise via the use of boxcar averaging. Adjacent data points within the time window are averaged, and with increased averaging cycles, the spectral width of the ETO measurements is dramatically narrowed, thereby further reducing noise. The ETO possesses two measurement channels with their own dedicated electronics, meaning that two sets of precision current sources and voltmeters are individually running at all times. The current source's maximum output is 100 milliamps with 1 nanoamp minimum precision. And the output modes include DC or AC with frequency range between 0.1 Hz to 200 Hz. The ETO can operate in a low impedance 4 wire measurement mode or a high impedance 2 wire measurement mode. In the 4 wire mode, the acceptable impedance range is between 10 nano ohm and 10 mega ohm. Two wire measurements can be performed from 1 mega ohm up to 5 giga ohms. Now we will perform a 4 wire measurement on the copper wire using the ETO module and compare that to measurements obtained using a standard DC source and voltmeter. We take a reading every second. When you compare the standard DC measurement in orange to the Qualm Design ETO measurement in blue, you can see that the ETO performs a far less noisy measurement at this level. The electrical transport measurement is a fundamental technique in the condensed matter laboratory. By knowing how to perform a forward lead measurement and having access to instruments that provide low noise data, you will be well on your way to conducting your materials research.